I'm not a techie. It's a union thing. I'm not even allowed to touch it. Thank you. Oh my gosh, is that the most beautiful thing you've ever heard? Of? members that we have with us here today. Hi, <laughs> Liz Larson, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. And now Liz Larson and Matt Collin, you've seen from Korea. No. <laughs> <laughs> the horrified look on her face. Um, we, we are lucky to have so many Company 6 members with us today. Sadly, we've lost some along the way. Our dear friend Elizabeth and our friend Charles. And um, there are two others who uh, couldn't be with us today for health reasons. Michael Maitland and Luciano Guerriero. Uh, but those of us who know them and love them, just want to wish them the best and let them know that we are thinking of them and we wish they could be here today. And so does Walt. Um, I thought of some other Walt business. <laughs> and I hope you have two. I'd like to share some with you. One was, of course, I have more questions than I do answers. Walt wouldn't do anything if you knew how to do it. I've done that already. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you're playing results, not following your objectives. They when you came to do a scene, you're so happy that you got the results for it. You didn't like that. Um, your first choice is usually either wrong or conventional. Ah. Not every impulse is golden. That was one part of the question. Oh, I was following the impulse. Not every impulse is golden. And one other I have here, uh, way back when we were in college, it was the 70s, and I think. I think pot was legal in college or in Westchester. It was a rule. Uh, so some of the students there were having a party, and Walt was socializing with us, and we had what I, I think was called a bomb. I'm not really familiar with that. I thought it was a pencil holder, but my friend said it was a bomb. We want Walt to get high with us, too. We're all young kids every day. And, uh, and he's trying to light it, and he couldn't figure it out. <laughs> And so Tim says to him, come on, Walt, didn't you ever get high before? And the Waltism that I would take with me to my grave was, I was eating acid when you were babies. <laughs> so I caught up something. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Doug. Doug's is Doug. <laughs> Walt just like to have a lot of people with the same name, so he wouldn't forget. Lenore, Doug, Doug, Lenore. <laughs> Michael, Michael, Michael. Ate. Doug Scrimmer is, many of you think he's Walt's nephew. I was one of those people. He is not. He's an imposter. He is not Walt's nephew. <laughs> he is Walt's cousin. And um, uh, I don't think. I don't remember meeting with Doug, uh, and I conversed when he asked me to, to host this, and boy, what an honor this has been hosting us. Thank you very much, whoever didn't want to do it. But I got to do it. But Douglas, remember Walt's cousin is joining him up, and he has a surprise for us, I believe. It says, coming soon, your special invitation to Masterworks Laboratory Theater's Patrons Preview. Celebrating the opening of MLT's new loft studio, Sunday, October 22nd, 1978, 5 p.m. Um, my brother and I, my brother Dan, right here, had been there two months previously with our grandparents and were told we made a terrible mess of the studio and we actually were never, never forgiven. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the final act of Walt's remarkable life living on stage. Um, but before I do, thinking back to that loft, I really would like to introduce my cousin Liza. I was going to read a passage from her new book, The Marriage Act, about her stay at the loft with Uncle Walt when she moved to New York City. So please. <laughs> Thank you so much. So one of my dreams in the six years that it took to write this book was that one day we'd have the book party at the loft, um, and we ran out of time before then, but I'm really happy that it's, it's published with Walt in it, um, with, the, with the pseudonym, um, but I think everyone here will recognize exactly who's who. Um, when my best friend and I moved to New York City after college with no money and 
Very few plans. Uh, Uncle Walt welcomed us in with open arms and um, great generosity and allowed us to stay in the loft on the two little um, fake couch beds um, <laughs> around on the computer at night. And, um, and um, when we had trouble finding an apartment of our own because of the job lack of job situation, um, poof, we were the new directors of marketing and publicity for Master of Science <laughs> Theater with <laughs> letters on official letterhead that we could give to the real estate broker and find a place. And whether that was because you know he was happy to see us shuffle our five suitcases out the door or his generous heart, probably a combination of both. But um, so lucky to have a relative like him um, just to see a working artist and teacher and um, someone so passionate about what he did creatively um, that he made that into his life really inspired me to want to do the same. Um, and I just need one volunteer. One of the, there are a few amazing Walt Chandlers. Can I borrow someone's voice for a couple lines of, yes, please? A couple lines of that one. No. Eddie. Right. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I'll, I'll show you. Thank you so much. <laughs> On a cold, blustery April morning in 2002, five months later than we had originally planned, Amir and I arrived at 40 West 22nd Street in Manhattan. It often happens that we are right about where our paths will lead. We just go about there by a getting there by a different means than originally planned. Uncle Van. My grandfather's brother offered to let Amir and me stay in his loft, where we would sleep in the same wallless open space where he brought folding chairs for the audience to sit on performance days. Two twin beds were pushed up against opposite walls. During the day, our beds were covered in fake leather disguised as couches. The steam heater rattled all night. Amir and I didn't tell Uncle Vance that we were married. Um, Amir um, and I were married for his green card um, that I wanted to keep him. <laughs> no point in forcing him to choose loyalty to me or to his niece, my mother, um, who works for the State Department Preventing Immigration Program. <laughs> <laughs> Which I argue in this book that it was not, it was definitely not, nothing fraudulent about that. <laughs> Even though the bumper stickers on his door clearly announced his causes, human rights campaign, Lambda, ACLU, Amnesty International, GLAD, PFLAG, Stonewall Democrats. As a gay rights activist whose own mother sent him to a psychiatrist to cure him, Uncle Vance would likely have been supportive, but he was also close with my mother. So why chance it one out? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Uncle Vance shouted, ambling down the hallway to meet us by the elevator, which opened straight into the loft. Welcome! 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 <laughs> oh, my, my, my. Oh, oh, my, 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 look at all these suitcases. Suitcases! <laughs> suitcases! We had five suitcases between us and glanced at each other having the same thought about the 25 Fox shipment arriving the day <laughs> I hugged Uncle Vance and stepped aside to introduce him to Amir. After greetings and welcomes, Amir and I retreated to the theater space to put our things away, behind curtains concealing an area for wardrobe, props, and quick costume changes. There were drawers of uniformly blue prop furniture and rolling wardrobe racks. Everything here was movable, stand-in. The unconscious seeks outward manifestation, and though I hadn't designed this space, it seemed fitting that this was where I landed. And I'll skip ahead a little bit. Uncle Vance created a show called Gilbert Without Sullivan, a flair for the theatrical ran in the family. Vance and Bridgeford had put on countless Gilbert and Sullivan musicals over the years, and they also brought separate and equally important skills to the table. Ridge was more like Sullivan, while Vance fit the Gilbert mold. My great uncles were a study in opposites, better together because they each brought to the 
the relationship, both professionally and personally, qualities the other lacked. They were each other's greatest champions. Rich was sweet, gentle, slow moving, while Vance was spitfire quick in gesture and wit. Rich cooked gourmet meals, Vance sipped gin and tonics at the table, and talked to Blue Streak about his new play or book, about, or about his methods of coaching actors. They had studied with Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler, and they didn't want to have children, but had a large and extended family of students and friends who were in and out at odd hours. When Ridgebert died, Vance said he lost a part of himself. He talked about Ridge all the time, productions they had worked on together, their travels, Ridge's birthday. Vance and Ridgebert were the only couple in my immediate family who didn't get a divorce, and they couldn't even get married. doing a book reading uh, in Brooklyn at 8 o'clock Monday evening, and details are available there. I know we're running over time, and I want to thank you so much for being so gracious, but um, when did we not in the past run over time? <laughs> we're going to have a lovely reception afterwards, and if you'll just give us a few minutes to set that up, um, mm -hmm. that would be terrific. Um, so about Walt's final act, um, as you know, in his early 80s, our dear Walt continued to teach and to perform, and um, he had a number of accidents and extended illnesses, which some of you have referred to, but it was in fact extraordinary for a man of 85 years to continue teaching, uh, to stay on stage, and his strength in part came from all of you, his dear friends and his students, who, who kept him going. And you all know that despite the hospitalizations followed by physical therapy and rehabilitation, he kept on going. I mean, we all talked about it, that we thought of him as the Energizer Bunny, right? We, we thought of him as a Timex watch. He, you know, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And, and, and so therefore, it really is with the, the deepest gratitude that we, the family who are here today, want to thank all of you, the extended family, who, who kept him going. Because you visited, you, you wrote, you called, you emailed, you cajoled, you called, you emailed, you made suggestions. Repeat. Repeat, repeat. Um, it honestly it would take me the rest of the day and most of the evening, well past midnight, and by then the food would be cold and spoiled. So I'm not going to thank all of you individually and itemize every single thing that all of you did. Just suffice it to say, Walt made it to 89 because of all of you. Um, for, for a man who spent all of his life living on stage and who tragically, tragically couldn't walk the last 18 months of his life, um, you kept him going. But, you know, when I think about this, I just want to briefly tell you about one person who's here today, because it was four years ago this month, four years ago this month in Village Care, we met a remarkable woman who's here today. Um, you know, when somebody becomes frail at a certain age and injures himself and re-injures himself because he lives in a 4,000 square foot space full of what some people call props and other people call booby traps. Um, <laughs> cause for concern, but, you know, as all you heard me say before, you don't tell a master, director, teacher, and actor what to do, you gently make suggestions. Repeat, repeat, repeat. You know, and so it was for, for three months in 2010. We worked daily at Village Care um, with the warmest, most attentive caregiver you could ever imagine. Time and again in the past, and some of you know this, going back to 2004, we hired home health, health care aides. Uh, only to see him fired a day or two later. Um, someone leaving the same day. Uh, but, but not Vidya. Vidya, you took us home. Um, you and Walt formed such a remarkable, incredible, inseparable bond. Um, you know, Vidya, you were always, always thinking who to reach out to. You, you know, uh, someone, some friend that Walt hadn't spoken to for a while, or some doctor here or there who could research something, some theater, even if, you know, it was only just to figure out how many to get to the show you were calling, whether it was one of the nieces, or whether his brother, rest his soul, couldn't be with us today, tragically. Um, everyone under the sun, Vidya, you reached out, and your compassion was just so astounding. I remember even when I would get phoned six times or ten times a day, a day, with the exact same question, you video would keep me calm and remind me about the virtues of keeping the wall happy. And as you all know, that wasn't always easy. Um, you know, I learned that caregivers have many facets. And um, 
you do rarely need someone who is platinum level, way above gold. So for the dear woman here who gave Walt a continually signed life for three and a half years and was with him 24 hours a day until his final breath, could you just quickly rise and give her a round of applause? digital project of Masterworks Laboratory Theater, because Walt, meticulous as he was, uh, identified several folks in his will to oversee a project, um, because this is not the final chapter, this is just the next chapter. This is the 45th anniversary year of Masterworks Laboratory Theater, and our goal this year is how to shape the future of the MLT archive. Um, you'll be happy to know we're already hard at work on scanning and digitizing Walt's archives for future use. I think Regina has already burned off the tips of her fingers in recent weeks putting all those documents into the scanner. And thank you for getting this going. Regina, it's fantastic. So the, the scanning project is going to continue through the end of June, and in summer we're going to proceed with the donation of the Masterworks Archives and Institution, probably the New York Performing Arts Library. Um, and our goal is by Walt's 90th birthday on August 24th to make archival material available to all of you on woodcover.com. So we're soliciting your photos, your documents, your memories, everything to the email address we set up, which is witchcovarian at gmail.com. Um, and so you're invited to share and to be a part of this project, as you always have been, because it's about all of you as well. So just before I finish, I'd like to say a very quick thanks to our wonderful MC today, Andrew Alberger. <laughs> I said he was 88 at the top of the show, even though I bet Walt wouldn't have minded if he shaved me a year. None of us would, right? We're all <laughs> uh, We had one student, when we were babies, at Purchase, who challenged Walt, who just didn't accept everything that he said, but wanted to know why. Why are we doing that? Well, why am I doing that? What are you talking about? And he had such a love relationship with her, and I remember going, I could never talk to that man. I'm so, that's my dad. Liz would stand up, well, and not in a mean way, but just why? Why am I going to do that? Okay, all right, as long as you tell me why. <laughs> We're uh, in for a treat. Liz Larson's here today. In between shows, Broadway's beautiful, and she is going to sing a song. So welcome, her, ladies and gentlemen, Liz Larson. these lyrics because I'm, I'm scared I might forget it, so I'll just hold them. Um, when people talk about, um, when people die and you talk about, oh, they're watching you and they're living on and their voices are living on in your head, it really is true with Walt because even while he was alive, his voice lived on. Every time I looked at someone on stage, I heard his voice say, where did that person come from? Where is he going? Whenever I wanted to pick up something on stage, how do I feel about that thing? And I feel it every single time I still walk on stage. This afternoon, this voice was in my head also. Without warning, I 
Hot time. 